Hello New Hope, and thank you for being a part of our online service. By now you probably know the drill, but I just want to take a minute and just uh, let you know, remind you of some of the resources that are available on our website, as, especially as we go into this uh, service. On the website you'll notice that there is a button for Family Discussion Guides. Now, uh, those are resources that you're able to click and you can print those off and there are activities and different things for your whole family, whether it's the youngsters all the way through adults. And so, you know, maybe you want to pause right now and uh, go ahead and, and print those off and be ready for the message. There's also something called Bible Study Guides and that's for individuals and small groups that want to dig a little bit deeper into the sermon, into the topic, into the text, and uh, those are available as well. You'll also notice some different ways to give. Uh, you can give through the website to uh, the New Hope General Fund. Uh, you can give through the website to the COVID-19 support. Uh, you can give through the website and, and support some of the local food banks. Uh, why, there's even a button on there that you can click where you would be able to set up an appointment to give blood. So uh, those are important and they're on there if you need to be able to use those. Now something new that I want to be able to mention to you uh, is an upcoming study that's designed to help you with your marriage. Now maybe your marriage is, is really struggling right now, or you may be in a fantastic marriage. It doesn't really matter which extreme you're at or if you're somewhere in the middle. This would be a study that would be very beneficial uh, to help you strengthen your marriage. Now a couple months ago, we had Randy and Julie Garris come and they did a, a weekend uh, seminar called Marriage Reboot. And while they were here and they gave that, it was fantastic. The content was great. And we want to make those sessions available uh, to those that maybe uh, had to miss that, or maybe you went to it, you enjoyed it, but you, you want to kind of get a refresher course on that. And so beginning on Thursday, May 21st, for four weeks, uh, we're going to have that special study, and it'll be uh, at 7 o'clock, and we're going to do it online through Zoom. And uh, so we want you to be a part of that. And you can sign up for that by going to our website at www.newhopechristianchurch.net and register uh, for that. And then we'll be able to send you some links and, and get you going with that. Finally, just want to let you know, we, for the last uh, several weeks, we've been going through a sermon series that uh, is on imitating the people skills of Jesus. And today we're going to be wrapping that up and we're going to be looking at Zacchaeus and then Following this series, then we're going to move into a series on the book of Colossians, which is going to be fantastic and you won't want to miss. So uh, thank you so much for joining with us today, and we hope you get a lot out of the message. Christian Cruz and I'm graduating from BCLW High School and my future plans include moving to California to pursue a career in the entertainment industry and one thing New Hope has taught me is to always be compassionate towards others no matter what situation they're in and yeah that's something I can use in the future. Spenson and I will be graduating from Spenson Academy, aka I'm homeschooled. And after high school, I will be going into cosmetology. And one thing that I will definitely be taking away from growing up in this church um, is loving people where they're at and giving grace to them like God has. Hello, my name is Jacob Thomas. I am a high school homeschool graduate. After high school, I plan on finishing up my Associates of Science at MCC and continuing my path towards becoming a medical doctor. One thing that New Hope has done for me as I've attended New Hope is they've allowed me to find God-fearing friends, and they've also encouraged me in my path with Christ. Hi, my name is Talia Trumbo, and I am graduating from GMG Secondary School. Um, once I graduate, I'm going to Ozark Christian College in the fall, and I'm going to study my music and worship degree down there. Um, one of the things that New Hope has taught me is to never be afraid to ask for help because you guys have been so helpful in my walk with Christ with these past two years, so thank you. Hi, I'm Quentin Wilder, and I'm graduating from West Marshall High School in State Center, Iowa. 
plan on attending Simpson College to study sports administration and play basketball. One thing that New Hope has taught me is that God will be there through the highs and the lows. Gogston, graduating from Marshalltown Community College. My plans are to transfer to the University of Iowa and major in creative writing. Hey, welcome to our online services here at New Hope Christian Church. We're glad to have you. I want to I want to test your intelligence today with a riddle. And I'm going to ask you a question and then I'm going to pause for a little bit while everyone there in your family or in your group answers the question. Now, don't take time to think about it. Just say whatever answer comes to your mind. So here is the riddle. Four people were riding in a car together. The perfect man, the perfect woman, the tooth fairy, and Santa Claus, all right? And they have a car accident, terrible car accident, and all but three of them um, die. Which one was the only one to survive? All right, talk amongst yourselves. Dude. Okay, hope you've all had a chance to answer. The only one to survive the accident was the perfect woman. You see, the other three don't even exist. <laughs> I, I thought I would be safe sharing that online when I didn't have a live audience in front of me. Now, that doesn't stop women all over the world from looking for the perfect man. Doesn't stop uh, men all over the world from looking for the perfect woman. But sometimes lost in all of the desirable traits a woman is looking for in a man is the one trait that drives all the others. The Apostle Paul talks about this in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 25 when he says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. You see, a selfless life is the key to dynamic relationships because everything else that is good in people begins with a life that has died to ourselves so that we can live for Jesus Christ. As the visible image of the invisible God, as the bodily form of the fullness of God, Jesus Christ is the perfect example on how husbands should treat their wives, really, truly, as the Almighty and the Divine, and Jesus Christ is the perfect example on how every human being should treat every other human being. Jesus once told his disciples, I have lived for you an example in my life that you should do for others as I have done for you. Today is the last day in our sermon series entitled The People's Skills of Jesus. The Gospels record for us uh, many of the character qualities of Jesus that attracted 
thousands of people to him 2,000 years ago. And the fact of the matter is, people are still attracted to Jesus today when they see his character qualities being lived out in those who follow him. And so in today's message, we observe two more people skills um, that we who follow Jesus would be wise to imitate in our own lives. Our text is found in Luke, the 19th chapter, and I'm going to begin reading from verse 1. Jesus entered Jericho and made his way through the town. There was a man there named Zacchaeus. He was the chief tax collector in the region, and he had become very rich. He tried to get a good look at Jesus, but he was too short to see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree beside the road, for Jesus was going to pass by that way. When Jesus came by, he looked up at Zacchaeus and called him by name. Zacchaeus, he said, quick, come down. I must be a guest in your home today. Zacchaeus quickly climbed down and took Jesus to his house in great excitement and joy. But the people were displeased. He's gone to be the guest of a notorious sinner, they grumbled. Meanwhile, Zacchaeus stood before the Lord and said, I will give half my wealth to the poor, Lord. And if I have cheated people on their taxes, I will give them back four times as much. Jesus responded, salvation has come to this house today. For this man has shown himself to be a true son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save those who are lost. The first people skill we notice in Jesus' encounter with Zacchaeus is this. Jesus has a sense of humor. Jericho was located about five miles west of the Jordan River, about 10 miles northwest of the uh, Dead Sea, and about 17 miles on a winding road east uh, of Jerusalem. There was living in Jericho a man named Zacchaeus. Now Zacchaeus was a tax collector, which meant he was hated by his fellow Jews. We'll talk more about that later. But Zacchaeus was not just a tax collector. He was a supervisor of many tax collectors who lived in that region around Jericho. The Bible tells us on more than one occasion that all things were created by God, all plants and all the animals. All we see on the outside of every object and everything that we can't see on the inside of every object, all the planets and all the stars, all the solar systems and all of the galaxies, all of the seas and everything in them was all made by God. Everything. The Bible declares for us um, some of the characteristics that God has. God is a, a jealous God. He's not wishing to share our affection for him with anybody or anything, anyone else. God is a loving God. He's a compassionate God. God is a, a giving God, and God is a forgiving God. So if God is the creator of all things, where does humor come from? <laughs> well, it comes from God. The fact is, not only is God the source of humor, but I'm pretty sure that God has a good sense of humor. I know when... I pray that God would help me find my sunglasses. He has a pretty big laugh as he sees them still on my head and I'm praying for them. Or times when I have prayed and asked that he would give me just the right thing and a message at just the right place. And 15 seconds later, I find it. I think God probably has a chuckle at that. Solomon writes, there is a time for everything, every activity under heaven. There is a time for us to cry and there is what? That's right, a time for us to laugh. Who gave us our sense of humor if God didn't? Who enables us to laugh if it wasn't God? Have you noticed how people oftentimes bond together over a meal? It was no accident that one of Jesus' first journeys with his disciples was to the marriage feast in Cana of Galilee. It was no accident 
that Jesus chose to eat with tax collectors and prostitutes and, and other such people on more than one occasion. Imagine the thousands who were there present, two different occasions when Jesus multiplied loaves and fish and fed thousands of people and, and the bond between those people as they would talk about that experience later. And it was, it's no accident that heaven has oftentimes been compared to a banquet. People bond together when they share food together. Likewise, how many times has laughter brought people together? Some of the closest times with my wife are when we laugh together, when we laugh with other people, other friends. The great preacher Robert Russell, who is now retired, said he, he frequently used humor in his sermons because it helped keep people's attention. And since audiences don't really participate with many amens these days, uh, laughter is one way they can participate in a sermon. St. Stephen Baptist Church in Louisville, Kentucky, is an African-American church with very lively song services. Robert Russell was invited by his colleague, Kevin Cosby, to come and preach at St. Stephen's. And Russell said to his friend, uh, Kevin, I don't know how well I'd go over in your church. I mean, you speak in a different rhythm. You have a whole level, different level of passion than I do. Your people oftentimes say amen to your, in your sermons, Kevin. The last time I heard an amen in our church, I got so flustered I lost my place. Do you think laughter will exist in heaven? I suspect that if there is a time for laughter here on earth, there will be plenty of laughter in heaven as well. Don't we normally think of people who are able to help others laugh as that being a positive character trait? We gravitate toward them like a magnet. Someone has said, and I quote, laughter is like changing a baby's diaper. It doesn't permanently solve any problems, but it makes things more acceptable for a little while. Amen, right? <laughs> Many people unchurched people have it in their head that Christianity is boring. Humor from Christians contradicts that notion. Jesus said we are the salt. We are the light in our world. And one way we can bring light into people's lives is to help them laugh. According to an extensive study at the University of uh, Maryland Medical Center in Baltimore, an active sense of humor along with regular laughter, helps prevent heart attacks. Dr. Michael Miller says, and I quote, we don't know yet why laughing protects the heart, just that it does. Bible told us a long time ago, a glad heart makes a happy face. A cheerful heart is good medicine. I'm wondering how many youth who are watching us under the age of 15 have been up in a tree during the past couple of years. On the flip side, how many youth, adults over the age of 25 have been up in a tree over the last couple of tree, uh, years? The closest I've come to being in a tree in the last two years was watching Treehouse Masters on television. Put yourself in Jesus' shoes. It's Octemberfest time in Jericho. Hundreds, maybe thousands of people lying the streets. And you're, as you're walking along, you look up and you see this short but distinguished adult man perched up in a tree. Wouldn't you find that comical? I'm fairly certain Jesus didn't look at Zacchaeus and, and scold him. Zacchaeus, you get down from that tree. You're just going to break an arm or break, break a leg if you fall out of that tree. In his book entitled The Humor of Christ, Elton Trueblood believes we have a preconceived mindset that Jesus was always serious. Great comedians today can make us laugh oftentimes just by the expressions on their face or the, the tone in their, their words. We don't have that benefit of watching Jesus' face or hearing the tone in his voice while he's teaching on YouTube. We have to use our imaginations because all we have are, are words written on a page. I think Jesus saw Zacchaeus in that tree and he laughed. Zacchaeus, what, what in the world are you doing, man? You come on down from that tree. I want to spend some time with you today. 
Trueblood said he began his research on his book when he and his wife were reading with their family uh, from Matthew chapter 7, and they're doing so in a serious way, and all of a sudden their four-year-old son laughed. Their boy saw humor when he pictured a beam of wood sticking out of someone's eye. Why don't we see that humor? Again, because we are predisposed to thinking that everything Jesus said was in a serious tone of voice. True Blood gives over 30 different examples of Jesus' humor in his teachings. Isn't it possible that Jesus had a big smile on his face and his, his listeners got a chuckle when he explained the rich trying to find their way into the kingdom of heaven is similar to a camel squeezing through the eye of a needle? When Jesus was talking about the Pharisees trying to be religious teachers or leaders for other people, he used the humorous picture of blind people trying to lead other blind people. You know, if you haven't watched yet the eight episodes of The Chosen on YouTube, man, sit down with your family and do so ASAP. It portrays Jesus laughing with his disciples at the marriage feast in Cana of Galilee. It shows Jesus sharing lighthearted stories with his disciples on, on their many journeys, their miles and miles of uh, walking they did together. And in the series, when the woman at the well realizes Jesus is the Messiah, she kind of chuckles. Oh, I'm going to tell everyone. And, and Jesus smiles and looks at her and says, I was counting on it. When Matthew, also a tax, tax collector, response to Jesus' invitation to follow him. He asked Jesus, where are we going? It was Mary Magdalene who replied, a dinner party. And Matthew says, well, I'm a tax collector. I'm not welcome at dinner parties. To which Jesus says, well, that's not going to be a problem tonight. You're the host. Jesus Christ was the only perfect man to ever live. And that logically means he had a perfect sense of humor. The sooner we accept that truth, the sooner we can start imitating that people skill in our own lives. Life is short, my friends. Take it seriously. But because life is short, don't take it too seriously. We don't have to be stand-up comedians. Jesus wasn't, and nowhere did I read in Scripture that humor is a spiritual gift. But we do need to see the lighter side of life. We need, do need to be able to laugh at ourselves on occasion. For some people, even a smile is a step in the right direction. The second people skill we see in Jesus' encounter with Zacchaeus is that Jesus cares about all people. Why were tax collectors hated so much by the Jews? It's because the tax collectors were Jews, hired by the Roman government to collect heavy taxes from their fellow Jews in order to pay and support the Roman Empire and its many pagan gods. In order to fill their own pockets, most tax collectors were charging more from their fellow countrymen than what the Roman government required, and that's why tax collectors were considered by Jews to be traded, traitors, and that's why they were hated so much. What was one of the major complaints against Jesus? Jewish religious leaders insisted Jesus was spiritually and morally unclean because he dared to associate with undesirable people like tax collectors and prostitutes and lepers and more. One of Jesus' 12 disciples was a former tax collector. Matthew was living in Capernaum when it, he, Jesus invited Matthew to follow the rabbi. And when the Pharisees saw Jesus eating with society's cast-offs, in Matthew's house. They were indignant. Why does your teacher associate with these kind of people, they asked Jesus' disciples. Jesus heard them. Jesus said, it's not those who think themselves spiritually healthy who need a doctor, but those who know they are spiritually sick. 
Jesus said, I didn't come to save those who already think they are righteous. I came to save those who know they need help and are seeking a savior. Jesus told a story further illustrating the truth. Two men went to the temple to pray one day. The Pharisee's prayer went something like this. God, I am so thankful that I'm not a robber. I'm not an evil person. I'm not an adulterer. And I'm certainly not like that tax collector. Why, I fast twice a week and I tithe of my income. Pharisee didn't see any issues he had that needed forgiveness. The Pharisee didn't see anything wrong in his life that he needed to change. On the other hand, without even looking to heaven, the tax collector's prayer went like this, God, I am a sinner. I need help. Please have mercy on me. And Jesus said, the man who humbled himself before God will be exalted by God, while the man who exalted himself before God will ultimately be humbled by God. Who are the tax collectors of today needing Jesus' healing touch? Zacchaeus' example shows us that even the richest of people materially can be spiritually poor. Riches and fame don't fill the need of the human soul. In recent years, Justin Bieber, Chris Pratt, Mark Wahlberg, Kirk Cameron, Kanye West, and many others have come to that conclusion and turned to Jesus instead. In addition, the drug addict needs to know they can be set free. The adulterer needs to know they can be forgiven. The homeless need to know they can have a, a mansion to live in eternally. The sexually abused need to, to know they can sense and experience unconditional love. Jesus wants to meet these people's needs today, their physical, emotional, mental, spiritual needs through you and I. Jesus Christ wants to touch these people today with his people skills through you and I. Young adults today and teens wouldn't recognize the names of Jerry Falwell and Larry Flint. Jerry Falwell was a devout Christian who uh, founded Liberty University and made it a point to involve himself and other Christians in politics. On the other hand, Larry Flint was the founder of Hustler magazine, a hardcore and crude pornographic magazine. Flint had said some vicious things about Falwell, and the two of them would often debate on college campuses. After one such uh, debate between the two in Florida, Larry Flint was writing on Jerry Falwell's uh, personal jet back to Lynchburg, Virginia. After uh, Larry uh, Flint went his way, after getting into Lynchburg, Jerry Falwell's son, Jonathan, who was along with them during the trip and had heard his father and Larry Flint on the plane flight talk about sports and food and, and politics and a variety of other topics, he had heard him. And so when Larry Flint leaves, he, he's bewildered. Dad, how could you sit on an airplane and carry on a conversation with Larry Flint as though you were lifelong buddies? Dad, everything about the two of you is opposite. He does all the things you preach against, and yet you treated him as if you two were lifelong friends. You treated him as though he were a member of your own congregation. Jonathan said his dad's response changed his view toward Christian ministry forever. And it was this, Jerry Falwell said, Jonathan, there's gonna be a day when Larry Flint is hurting and lonely and he'll be looking for help and guidance. He's gonna pick up the phone and call someone and I wanna earn the right to be the one he calls. 
When Jerry Falwell died in the year 2007, Larry Flint said this, and I quote, I, hate every, I hated everything Jerry Falwell stood for, but after meeting him in person, we became good friends. Larry, uh, Jerry would often visit me in California and we would debate together on college campuses. I always appreciated his sincerity, even though I knew what he was selling and he knew what I was selling. Zacchaeus was lonely and hurting. He was also searching to fill that emptiness in his soul. And Zacchaeus, after all he had heard, wondered if maybe, just maybe Jesus could be the one to help him. Jesus not only invited himself to Zacchaeus' house, Jesus said it was imperative that I come to your house. I must stay at your house today. I wonder what the two of them talked about all day. You suppose they talked about food, politics, sports, and other ordinary topics? Eventually, at some point, I'm quite certain Jesus brought the conversation to uh, Zacchaeus' spiritual needs. And whatever it was Jesus said in that moment, Zacchaeus was willing to make restitution to all those he had cheated and wronged in the past as proof to Jesus that he was a changed individual. And Jesus said, today, salvation has come to this house because this man's faith makes him a spiritual son of Abraham. It is people like Zacchaeus, Jesus said, that I came to seek and to save. The Hound of Heaven is a 182-line poem written in the 1800s by an English poet named Francis Thompson. In that poem, he says, like a hound dog that never gives up in its pursuit of a rabbit or a fox or a prisoner, so it is, he says, Jesus Christ never gives up in his pursuit of the people he loves like you and I. In the 1930s, Joseph Stalin ordered a purge of all Christian believers and all Bibles in Soviet Russia. In Stavropol, uh, Russia, thousands of personal Bibles were confiscated from people and locked up while multitudes of believers were sent to prison camps as enemies of the state. Most died in those prison camps. By the 1990s, the Soviet Union was opened up for evangelism. And a Christian missionary team was in Stavropol, but they were having difficulty getting the Bibles they had brought with them uh, from shipped from Moscow to Stavropol so they could uh, distribute them amongst the people in that city. When someone mentioned a warehouse outside of town where confiscated Bibles had been locked up since the 1930s, the team went to prayer. Eventually, one member mustered the courage to ask officials if the Bibles were still there, and if they were, if, if the team could have them. And amazingly, the answer was yes and yes. The missionary team returned the next day with a truck and several Russian people to help load the Bibles. One of them was a, a skeptical, hostile agnostic college student who had come just so that he could get paid for the day. As they were loading Bibles, one team member noticed the young man had disappeared. Hoping to take a Bible for himself, this young man had slipped away, taken a Bible, opened it up, and they found him crying in the corner of the warehouse. Out of the thousands of Bibles that were in that uh, warehouse, the one this young skeptic stole was that of his grandmother. The inside page of that Bible had her handwritten signature. Through the prophet Jeremiah, God asked this question. Can anyone hide in a secret place where I cannot find them? 
The answer is no. The hound of heaven loves us so much. He pursues us irregardless of where we go and irregardless of what we've done. Jesus said, I came from heaven to earth to seek and to save, to pursue those who are lost. Everyone watching this message falls into one of two categories. There are those of whom the hound of heaven is still pursuing. And you're still running from him. If you happen to fall into that category, why are you running? Why don't you just stop and see just maybe if what he's done for you and if what you're looking for is found in him. If you fall into that category, call us at the church uh, office and, and someone will connect with you. And then there are those of us who have already found Jesus Christ and discovered that Jesus is more than sufficient to meet every need that we have, to, to fulfill everything we're searching for. For those of us who fall into that category, let us never forget that society today has its untouchable people as well. People whom others won't get near, either because of their appearance or their immoral behavior or their political views or their lifestyle, and the list can go on and on. Because Jesus Christ loves all people, we must love all people. So let us then, my friends, uh, family, uh, New Hope, let us imitate the people skills of Jesus Christ. Let us be an instrument through whom others find Jesus. And if we have loved ones who still do not know that Jesus is the way, that Jesus is the truth, and Jesus is the life, let us relentlessly, continuously, Lift up their names before the hound of heaven, the one who came to seek and to save all who are lost. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for never, ever giving up on us. Thank you for placing people in our paths at just the right time, for allowing events and circumstances to occur uh, at, at such a time in our lives that, God, we will look toward you. We will search for you because I know that when we do, your promise is we'll find you. And we will discover that you have been pursuing us the entire time. Thank you, Lord, for the many people skills that we have learned in Scripture that Jesus had as he interacted with individuals. Help us, empower us, Holy Spirit, to to imitate those people skills in our lives today, 20 centuries later, so that people can find uh, Jesus through the Jesus they see living in and through us. Thank you for the power of your word. And I pray, God, that it would be evident in the way that we live each and every day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So thanks again for joining us uh, here on our online services at New Hope Christian Church. Let's go out and, and be the church wherever God uh, calls us to do life. Thanks.